Well, as I, we gave a little taster, I guess, uh, at the end of last period of what we're talking about. So we've been talking about uh, dissolved components being carried downstream. Um, we've talked about uh, diffusion and mechanical dispersion as two mechanisms that uh, allow that transport to occur. Uh, we talked about defining an equation that represents those behaviors and then having a closed form solution to that equation for some specific geometries that allow us to be able to um, say what plumes will look like as they, they move downstream. And so everything that we did within that, um, we assumed, and we talked about it last time, was conservative. And today, uh, we will start doing the not liberal, but non-conservative. And as you mentioned last time, all it means is that the mass that's included in the aqueous phase, dissolved, uh, no longer stays there. It gets attached to the solid substrate. And of course, if it's attached to the solid substrate, one, it's not in the aqueous phase, so it can't, you'd expect it to reduce the concentration. And if it's attached to the static substrate, it's not moving downstream, and so you might expect the, um, the front of the concentration, concentration front, not to travel as fast as it would do otherwise. And so that's what we're dealing with. And so the mechanism that allows us to do that are these two mechanisms of retardation and attenuation that have slightly different um, connotations. And it really is uh, referring to the fact that we could have reactions going on or we could have sorption going on, which would do this. And um, as a result of that, uh, we can look at what the effects of having a sorbing component uh, in terms of the concentration profile as it goes downstream. <coughs> so that's, that's essentially what we'll try and do today. Um, the slightly subtle difference between retardation and attenuation is that attenuation is non-reversible. <coughs> so sometimes you hear the term natural attenuation as a way of cleaning up sites, and that is just that biodegradation changes the components into something hopefully benign and is irreversible, and which is good, never reverts back again, and your problem is solved. So that could mean reactions that don't switch backwards. Retardation means reversible, and so res refers to uh, sorption. So sorption means if you have a high concentration, it will sorb preferentially onto a, a site which has a lower energy. But if once you remove that higher concentration and put in pristine <coughs> water, you'd get reverse sorption, desorption back because the gradient of uh, concentration is reversed. And so that's what we are talking about. So subtle difference between them, but that's what we're attempting to talk about. Um, there's a, a variety of reasons why we might think that would occur. I don't think we need to worry too much about them. Adsorption and desorption is the one that we'll kind of cast it into, but it could be a whole series of other irreversible reactions which kind of look <coughs> absorption-like in terms of their influence, in terms of reducing the concentration in the aqueous phase and maybe uh, slowing down the pace of the front as it moves through the system. And so all kinds of reactions. Not sure that matters so much either. I'm going to zip through these. I would write this out, but I'm not going to. So this, this is the, the guts of it. I'm not going to pussyfoot around today. I'm going to go right to the meat. And so we've talked about this advection dispersion equation. We've talked about what the individual terms are. We've talked about the fact that this is accumulation. We've talked about this is, all of this is mass in minus mass out. And I suppose, so a dispersion part, which looks like diffusion, even if it's mechanical dispersion, <coughs> and a um, advective part. And so we know what part of the profile, this is the kind of sharp front that's moving through. 
And this is the smoothening of that front or dispersion around the front, which canters the, the front over at an angle instead of being vertical. And of course, the mass in and mass out is into the aqueous phase. And so if we think about taking some of that mass out and plastering it onto the static porous medium, which isn't going anywhere, we could think about an extra term which allows us to do that. And this extra term would be this one. We could think of another one due to reactions, Rxn. So a rate of change of concentration with time due to a reaction. So you have A and B reacting and becoming C. So A and B are taken out of solution and they're replaced by C. So we'd have to account for that somehow. But really we're talking about taking it out of the aqueous form by sorption and plastering it onto the sub substrate. And so this is a term that kind of does that. This is the bulk density of the aquifer, <coughs> rho d. This is the volumetric moisture content. It's, it says below here. This term, we've used this term. This is bulk density. And this is a rate of um, change in concentration that's sorbed onto the grains. So C star is the concentration that's sorbed onto the grains, not that's present in the water. So now the equation, instead of being written <coughs> homogeneously in terms of aqueous concentration, which of course all of these terms are, it has this um, unusual term which represents the concentration that's on the solid. And so what we'd like to do is to be able to, to change that. And one way to do that is quite simply to be able to say, to take this term here, and to, we could write the rate of change of concentration on the solid with time is equal to the rate of the concentration in the aqueous phase and the concentration in the aqueous phase. So it's just you know one multiplying by one. And our utility of doing that is that now we have a term <coughs> which is written in terms of this concentration and actually looks exactly like this term here. And the other terms that we're left with are different. So in other words, we could write this term as rate of change of aqueous concentration with time, which is the screen term. And I guess we could write this other term as the rate of change of concentration on the solid as a function of the, con no, it's not a rate of change. The concentration on the solid as a function of the concentration in aqueous form. And we could write this further as what we'll call a distribution coefficient. Don't know if you've used the term in your other classes. So I'm just keeping on developing this equation going leftwards instead of rightwards. So K, KD is referred to as a distribution coefficient. And we can talk about its units. And so something that we can determine. And so the idea is uh, this. So if you imagine taking a beaker with um, a uh, sand in it, your aquifer. You put in some concentration of an aqueous fluid and over some relatively short time it will sorb onto the grains of this. If it's activated carbon it might sorb quickly. <coughs> if it's uh, quartz it might sorb slowly. But it reaches some kind of equilibrium and that's all we're interested in. So we're assuming that the sorption has taken its full course and reached equilibrium. And it's this equilibrium which defines the sorption behavior. And so if we think of that, this is just this expression that we already developed uh, above. We took this term, we multiplied it by dc over dc, which is what we've done here. It's just this term here. And so this value here is what we've called the distribution coefficient. 
And so the definition of distribution coefficient is the ratio of the concentration on the grains to the ratio in the solid. And so you can imagine in taking a beaker, I'm not sure how best to draw it. I guess you do this. I'm just going to draw C star and C. So you take your beaker. It has your porous medium in it. You add water with something at some concentration at C1. And this is C1. And somehow, you measure what the concentration is on the, uh, on the substrate. You could, of course, get this by seeing how the concentration in the aqueous form changes because some of it's gone and been sorbed on the solid. would be one easy way to do it. And then you double the concentration within the water that you're putting in your bucket to C2. And you see what the concentration at equilibrium is that it sorbs onto the solid. And so in each of these cases, we're looking at something after this time, right? Once it's reached equilibrium, <coughs> No more can get on it. No more sites are available for it to join, and therefore it's set at a constant value. And therefore we have two points. And the two points would define an isotherm. That's really all an isotherm is. And this would be a linear isotherm. Uh, you can think of other isotherms like Langmuir and Freundlich isotherms that are nonlinear. Freundlich is a log linear one, and uh, Langmuir is a, a ratio of two, a limiting value, it asymptotes to limiting value. But basically the um, ratio of these two, if it's a linear one, then as you double the concentration of the aqueous phase, you double the concentration that's sorbed. And so if when you did your next experiment, it would be up here and up here, etc. And so that's, that's all it is. So that's all the isotherms are. And so we can imagine that they come in different forms. This is the only one that we'll deal with. And you can just change the system before. We had that. This is how we wrote it before. These happen to be changes, which of course it is. We can just ignore that. But it's just the ratio of the concentrations in aqueous solution to that on the solid. Freundlich may be nonlinear, that it has uh, a power exponent to it. If it's less than one, then it's below it, the linear one. Obviously, if it's one, it's a linear relationship. And if it's greater than one, it's uh, concave, concave upwards, I guess. And you can usually take logs of these, and the logs would plot as a straight line, of course, because it's a, a power. And a Langmuir isotherm is just one that asymptotes at a single maximum value. The idea being that on the surface of the, the grains, you only have a finite a number of sorption sites. Once you've occupied all of them, then adding more concentration doesn't allow you to fill them up anymore. And so that's what means. We won't use that in here. So what we'll do is we'll return back to our uh, expression that we had before. We will change this term over by rewriting this term here as being this here. So we just multiply both sides by dc star over dc multiplied by concentration by concentration. I guess this is time. Uh, we take out the value, which is the one that we want. And therefore, we're left with kd and this whole term reverts to being dc dt. And because this now is in exactly this, is in, not doing very well. This term here is in exactly the same form as this here. We can just move this over to the other side. And if we move it over to the other side, we get exactly what's written below. 
the term which is originally there, which is this one, and the term which we've moved over there, which is this one. And you know, the punchline is exactly this, is that we end up with a term which not surprisingly from what we've been talking about is called a retardation coefficient. This whole term is called a retardation coefficient. This term is always bigger than zero, and so it ranges from, uh, it's always gr greater than one, and it's always less than infinity, I suppose, which scales it. And of course, uh, if we divide both sides through by this term, then we get this, we get this, and we get this, right? We're just dividing this through by itself, so r over r is just equal to 1. This is just r over r. So that's it. So that makes it pretty straightforward. And so when I was showing off at the end of class that I could actually remember what I was going to be talking about uh, today before we got there, is that these terms just modify the advection dispersion equation. So that instead of the dispersion, mechanical dispersion being dl, it goes to being dl divided through by a number big, one or bigger. And it's, because it's divided by itself, it has to have no, it has no dimensions, right? Because this is one, this term, the units of kd have to be the reciprocal units of density. Volumetric moisture content is just a volume per volume uh, ratio. So the units of kd have to be uh, meter squared per kilogram, uh, or volume per unit mass. And also, the advective velocity goes to being an advective <coughs> velocity divided by retardation coefficient. Again, reduces it. And so from our kind of understanding, if you like, of what this does to the advection dispersion equation, is that if this little figure at the bottom represents our core, this is our spatial figure, bless you, then all this little cameo here represents is a concentration, relative concentration that looks like this. So this is this one here. Then you'd expect that where this point gets to, the 50% concentration, its location is dictated by the advective velocity. So if we're halving the advective velocity, if retardation is 2, then it just means it's gone half as far. So it's reduced in length. And so, as we said last time, this length that's traveled, which is equal to the product of advective velocity and time, is just going to be equal to the advective velocity times time divided by the retardation. Half as far if the retardation factor is 2. Wait, does that say equal length? Length. This here? Yeah. 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 Looks like an E, perhaps, I guess, yeah. And the other part is it's kind of self-sharpening. So, that, that's, so that what we just looked at is a consequence of this. It's traveled half as far, and therefore that's why it looks like this. The reason this is more sh steep is that we've halved the dispersion. So its normal dispersion is some magnitude. Now it's half of that. So the, re the reason that this is canted over instead of being vertical is because of dispersion. If the dispersion is less, it makes sense that it should be steeper. And so. Just uh, heuristically uh, and intuitively, we'd expect these two behaviors. Travels less far, and it travels less far in this amount. And the, sh the front is sharper because the effective dispersion amount is less. Uh, so that's it. And so that's exactly what we'd expect. And I suppose also, you know, when we we're talking about um, breakthrough, It also means that we can get these, re these um, RTD curves, 
Remember we got RTD curves in terms of two parameters. TR, which was velocity time over length, is that right? Velocity and time is a length traveled. <coughs> so by the time it's gone one pore volume, it's traveled the full length of the core. So this value here is sometimes equal to one. So this is TR. And we had Peclé number. Not RE, but Peclé number. And Peclé number was the ratio of advection to dispersion. So advection is the velocity, advective velocity times time, times length actually, isn't it? Is that right? This is in meters squared per second. Uh, this is in meters per second meters, so right units. And so I suppose if we're allowing this for, to be a non-conservative system, then this would be advective velocity divided by retardation. Right? These two terms here, they transform. And it would be a length traveled and it would be a dispersion coefficient divided through by retardation. And so the net effect is that these two cancel out. So the Peclé number doesn't change. So these would actually be for Peclé numbers. Say this is for Peclé number of 10, say. But this one will change, right? So if we do the same substitution for this, this would change to be a velocity divided by retardation for this function here, times time over the length. And so the calculations that we use these curves for, we'd have to be sure that we'd change this uh, poor value magnitude to be corrected for retardation. Right? It washes out of this because it's on the top and the bottom. It's only on the bottom in this particular case. And so we have to be aware of that. But all the calculations that we did for these one-dimensional problems, uh, we can do. We can use those same equations. We just have to use effective parameters, which are dispersion divided by retardation and velocity divided by retardation factor. OK? Make sense? So, well, we don't have much more to talk about. Uh, we could talk about what those curves are. It doesn't really matter. So how do we use this? Um, so these are the same data that we looked at last time. So the left-hand one was what we messed around with. Um, this is Borden, Canadian Forces Base Borden in uh, southwestern Ontario. Um, this now happens to be an amalgam of different ones. So actually, it's different. So remember what we looked at last time. We looked at the chloride ion solution for it moving downstream. And so chloride is conservative. It stays in solution. It doesn't sorb onto the quartz or any organic carbon that's in the aquifer. And so that these clouds, as we move downstream, we're getting bigger and more stretched out as we move downstream. <coughs> And the, the centers of masses were representative of the advective velocity or the advective travel length and allowed us to calculate that. So now if we take the, um, the chloride solution, and specifically, I guess, the one after almost two years, which is the one here, and look at it plotted on this figure that Fetter plots in his uh, book, the chloride ion has gone the same distance. But also within the cocktail, which was reduced, released from here, was uh, carbon tetrachloride and also tetrachloroethylene. <coughs> and they all happily traveled down together. But just like uh, chromatographic separation in the dye, you know, when you put the, uh, the filter paper into the dye in your physics experiment and you watched different colors up at, come up at different rates, this chromatographic separation is due to the retardation. And PCE after two years has gone this far, I guess to this point here. 
and carbon tetrachloride has gone this far. And so that is just indicative of the fact that they're lagging behind because they can travel less far. And I guess we could uh, do the retardation. Retardation is equal to um, the, the velocity times length traveled. <coughs> Let's see. So what am I going to do? Yeah, it's just the retard. Yes, it's not. Retardation is going to be the velocity of the non-conservative. No, it has to be conserved, right? Velocity of the conservative divided by the velocity of the non-conservative. Velocity is equal to um, length conservative over time conservative and length non-conservative over time conservative. We're doing the um, ratio at the same point in time, so these cancel out. So it's just the ratio of the conservative length traveled to the non-conservative. And so in this particular case for each of these, it's um, the length traveled is 57 meters for chloride. And for carbon tetrachloride, it's 23.5. And that's going to be equal to the retardation coefficient for carbon tet, which is roughly two, right? It's the things that are written down here. And for PCE, uh, the number would be uh, 57 divided through by, I don't know, is it 13 meters? Which is retardation for. PC, which is about four, right? 4.38 to be exact. So that's it. And so I guess um, we went through this long extended journey last time. Let's do a test on the core to get diffusion coefficients. No, we can't do that because we're not sampling. The core is not big enough and we're not sampling heterogeneity, which is what dispersion is. Oh, we could do push-me-pull-you push tests in wells, or we could do two-well tracer tests. No, we don't want to do those. One, because the scale isn't quite big enough. Two, because the gradients in those are much bigger than we'd experience in real life. And so finally, we lumbered on the, the idea that a natural gradient tracer test would be what we'd want. And so in this case, if you have <coughs> these data, this allows you to get directly the retardation and of course, if you have the retardation and you know that it's equal to 1 plus bulk density divided by volumetric moisture content and distribution coefficient, then if you know that this is equal to 2 and that you know your density of your aquifer is 2,000 uh, kilograms per cubic meter, and your aquifer is saturated, so this becomes the porosity, and it's equal to 30%, then you can immediately calculate KD uh, in situ if you wanted to. You could also measure KD in the lab by doing something in a sample, by trying to fit the dispersion <coughs> coefficient to that sample, but it has all the drawbacks that we talked about last time that a small sample perhaps isn't going to give you that. And so... That's kind of it. Um, so this is so, so this is what you could do. If you know what your retardation coefficient is as a function of bulk density, dis, um, <coughs> volumetric moisture content, if it's saturated, this is the porosity. Then you can. This might be the only parameter you don't know. You can rearrange this to subtract one off to the left hand side divide both sides by bulk density and multiply both sides by porosity. So you have KD. 
and you take your retardation coefficient, subtract one, and multiply by this product, and that's all that's done here. So you get the value of um, distribution coefficient directly from the retardation, if you have the retardation data, which you may or may not have. And you just have to be careful with your units. You would know that since the units of bulk density are in kilograms per meter cubed, then the units of KD must be in meters cubed per kilogram from this, right? This has no units. And if you're adding one to it, which has no dimensions, then the units have to uh, balance out. And so this could be in meters cubed, or it could be liters, could be grams per liter, or milligrams per, uh, per milliliter, or grams per milliliter, or kilograms per liter, etc. cetera. Uh, but they have to be in those two units. Obviously, a liter is a volume, and a kilogram is a mass. And this part here we can't do yet. Next time, what we'll talk about is the fact that we can get values for these distribution coefficients from some very specific properties that solvents have in interacting with um, carbon. So typically, not true for this particular aquifer, but the reason for this retardation, that this is only going half as fast and this is going a quarter as fast as the con conservative solute, the reason for that of often is that there's activated there's natural carbon in these shallow aquifers, and it sorbs naturally onto that natural carbon and is lost from the flow regime. <coughs> it just so happens that in uh, Borden, it's not very carbon rich, and most of the um, sorption occurs directly onto to the grains. In the case where most of the sorption occurs onto the naturally occurring carbon that's in the aquifer, then it turns out that you can get values for these distribution coefficients from things like octanol water partition coefficients. In other words, the solubility of octanol as it goes into solution in water gives you some indication of how that solution would sorb onto carbon, and therefore you can get this KD for a whole bunch of different solvents. And so we'll talk about that next time, but it only works if the main agent by which it's removed from the aqueous phase onto the solid is by going on to carbon. And if there's no carbon in the aquifer, these estimates aren't very good. And so this calculation down here is calculating what the distribution coefficient should be for each of these two compounds if we calculate it theoretically from this octanol, actually from solubility of the stuff in water. And it turns out not to be a very good predictor for this particular aquifer. And the reason it's not a very good predictor is because this particular aquifer doesn't have carbon in it, and that empirical method to calculate the distribution <coughs> coefficient assumes that it's all sorbed onto carbon, which isn't true. So that's it. So that's almost all I wanted to talk about. I guess the final thing is this one, one slide. Um, and that is, in the same way that we talked about uh, dispersion, so remember, we talked about the advection dispersion equation. The reason that we can use this equation <coughs> the reason we can use this equation with this term here, that we lump together both the um, the diffusive part and the, the mechanical dispersion part. And the reason we can do that is because dispersion, mechanical dispersion, looks exactly like diffusion. It's a different mechanism completely, and if mechanical dispersion is a large, then it can be much bigger than this, completely swamps it. Uh, and so we can also look at processes in aquifers which look like this retardation effect, sorption, but really aren't quite that effect. And so if you imagine a, f a fracture, and that fracture's in granite, uh, and it's, the fracture is carrying water, 
and there is a dissolved component in it. You could imagine that if you looked along this particular fracture and you looked at the concentration profile to the front, which is here, then it might look like this. Plug flow, no dispersion. If you imagine this fracture then um, being porous, or, or being in a porous medium, so that the block either side of it was porous and had water surrounding the grains, then you could imagine as stuff came down here, this would diffuse into the water in the pore space. If it's diffusing into the water in the pore space in the rock, away from the, the fracture, then you'd expect two things to happen. You'd expect this front to not go so far for the 50% <coughs> point, for the 50% point. Not good. So if this is the 50% part, instead of being here, it's retarded. But not by absorption in this particular case, just by the fact that it's diffusing into the porous rock. It's present in the water in the pore space, and so it's lost to the water that's in the fracture. And so it's re reduced the concentration and delayed the breakthrough. If now you allow adsorption onto the grains that are present within the porous medium, then the concentration also within the porous medium would be dropped because it's now being taken out of the water and being plastered on the grains. And so you could imagine that would also be another mechanism by which you would, if you look at the 50% mark here, you do two things. You reduce the concentration and you progressively allow it to go progressively less far downstream. So this length here is less than this one here, which is less than this one here. And so <coughs> these things look like sorption going on, but they're really not that. There's no sorption going on here, right? It's just diffusing into the water. It's lost to the fracture, and so it looks like it's being sorbed maybe into the fracture wall, but that's not what's going on. And so you can imagine some processes that would look like sorption, but would, would, uh, would not, strictly speaking, be it. And so that means that if we wanted to treat the process as equivalent to sorption, then what we would do, I guess, would be we would take this expression, we'd realize that this term is on the right-hand side, we'd divide both sides by r, and we just use these equivalent properties to be able to get this behavior. And that's it. So that's it. I think that's it. So next time what we'll talk about is trying to figure out exactly the magnitudes of this uh, distribution coefficient. And we'll get it either from these octanol water partition coefficients or from whatever the solubility of different solvents are in water, which is an indicator. Both of these terms allow us to get what we've called KD. And if we have KD, then we get retardation coefficient, which is just one. Over D. So that's, that's our reason for doing that. We could talk about it when we have one material. We could talk about it when we have cocktails, as we did for the Borden site, which is uh, using Reynolds' law. And then we can talk about <coughs> removal lates once it's in, in place. That's it.